Good afternoon. We are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. My name is Kimberly Colbert and I will be your host today. A recording of this presentation will be sent to all attendees and those who have registered. We will be answering questions at the end of the webinar, so please place your questions in the chat box. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Michael Violette is a professional engineer and is founder and CEO of Washington Laboratories. He has worked in compliance since 600 megahertz seemed like a high frequency and has authored numerous articles and publications for and about the industry. He ex has expanded WLL's operations to Asia and co-founded American Certification Body with operations in the US, the EU and Asia providing certification services to the global market. So without further ado, let's turn our attention to fundamentals of MIL standard 461 with Mike Violet. Hi, Mike, how are you today? Good, Kimberly, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for everyone who's attended this uh, webinar. Uh, so we're organizing this. I'll have a few intro words. Uh, you know, I got to do an advertisement up front. That's what my marketing people say. And then we'll go through an overview of test environments and an overview of the MIL standard versions, the various versions that have propagated since the 60s, and a walk through the essential tests that are in the current versions that are commonly used. As Kim mentioned, we have a recording for this, and we will send, send links after this event. So as Kim mentioned, I've uh, been around for a while. Uh, I already, I'm already certified EMC engineer. I'm also a notified body and certification body for, for radio projects. I, feel like I'm very lucky. We got to have lots of cool projects during my career and, and wonderful people. So just a short advertisement. We've been around since 1989. We are focused on EMC, wireless, environmental, and product safety. We've done several, several projects since that time, uh, spanning from nuclear energy to transportation, communications, uh, energy, uh, industrial types of projects. I started this with my father, who's kind of over my right shoulder here. And um, we've been uh, lucky to have uh, been working in the Mid-Atlantic and internationally for uh, over 30 years. So anyway, a quick uh, definition of EMI, electromagnetic interference. Uh, potential sources can be any kind of electronic device. It can be a natural device, natural product or, or man-made uh, device and can occur wherever electrical phenomena are active. So man-made environments, factories, homes, uh, out in the field, you name it. Uh, we can also have uh, natural sources such as lightning, ESD, solar activity, et cetera. So we have two forms of modes of conduction of our uh, movement of electrical energy, electromagnetic energy. You could have conducted interference, which uh, means you've got wires or cables, and you can have radiated EMI, which means that you're passing uh, electromagnetic energy through space. And this could be a far field or a near field coupling type of example. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, whenever you have a real electromagnetic interference situation, you have to have three uh, modes or three elements of this. There's typically a source of some kind or the culprit, we call it. There's gotta be a coupling method either through space or conducted. And then there's a sensitive device we call the victim. And so you can have a victim that has uh, also energy that's kind of emanating. So when we're doing tests such as EMC tests, we often characterize uh, both modes of these uh, type of phenomena when we're doing a, a device test. The EM environment's very complex and getting more complex every day, particularly with the profusion of wireless services, 5G, 6G, radio frequency usage, the spectrum is very crowded and it's getting more crowded every day. So the problem or the challenge for EMI is that you have to do some additional system planning and design for either commercial or military products, depending on where you're gonna put it. You have to look at system layout, location, configuration, you get all the way down to the printed circuit board level. And that's typically where EMC is, is begun when you're doing a design of, of a new product or integrating a, an existing product with new uh, uh, electrical systems. So you got to do uh, some component um, testing, making sure and analysis uh, during an analysis that uh, you can minimize the effects of uh, potential interference and uh, susceptibility. 
Uh, this certainly in, impacts your uh, time to market. And one of the things that we've noticed during the pandemic pandemic is uh, supply chain shortages and parts obsolescence are requiring uh, new designs and revisiting old de designs as uh, things are getting harder to get. I understand from our customers, uh, lead times for some parts have gone from 12 weeks to a year or more. So it's a real challenge. So in order to stay in the game, uh, new designs or reconfiguring existing designs have been necessary. And of course, this impacts uh, testing and delivery of the devices ultimately. So, you know, the EMI can be a nuisance or it can be pretty deadly. Uh, one of the uh, classic cases of this is the USS Forrestal. Uh, 1967 was uh, tooling around in the, in the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam. And a uh, somehow it was suspected that the interference problem uh, ignited a rocket on board the deck. And the resultant uh, catastrophe claimed uh, 32 aircraft and 134 casualties. Uh, during the Falkland Island War, the HMS Sheffield, Sheffield had shut down their radar uh, to avoid uh, self-jamming EMI. And you can have other more catastrophic uh, situations like this. Um, and these are kind of a sort of worst case examples of uh, how EMI can you know, cause real problems. So the opposite sort of EMI is electromagnetic compatibility. That means everything's working in its space and not interfering with, with any other uh, nearby uh, systems or, or, um, or uh, electrical um, installations. So in this case, we need to make sure that the sources have been sufficiently suppressed. So we've reduced coupling paths through shielding or through filtering. Uh, the victims are sufficiently hardened and a number of the tests that we'll discuss are to make sure that the susceptibility of, of military systems is at, is at a minimal level and a combination of the above. So the electromagnetic environment in the military world is really complex. And uh, so devices that are being installed must perform as state of the art because the uh, demands of the military uh, environment and battlefields and so forth and war planning, you know, you have to have a high degree of re reliability. And so the devices must operate in a hostile environment. Uh, notably, uh, surface ships, uh, naval surface ships, you know, they may have hundreds of antennas operating across the whole spectrum. And so some of the tests that we do in that, uh, for that environment, you know, include a broad spectrum of, of measurements and different levels, uh, depending on where the device might be installed. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Of course, it's not just electromagnetics that you have to consider, but uh, environmental uh, uh, effects such as uh, temperature, humidity, shock, vibration, uh, those uh, sort of what we call shake and bake kind of uh, simulations. So the military environment in general is, is pretty challenging. But we're gonna talk about the 461. Uh, sort of the evolution is shown on this page. It was originally written in 1967 and then quickly got ad adapted and updated uh, in 68. And then there are different versions, uh, A, B, C, D. And right now we're up to G, which was uh, adopted in December of 2015. So it's the latest version. And uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, very um, e excellent uh, 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 verse there, actually, if uh, you were looking for um, an overview of what the electromagnetic uh, reasons are for a lot of the tests, uh, you can go to 461, the Appendix A. So four modes, four basic modes, conducted emissions. That means you've got wires and cables carrying noise or interference out of a system. Conducted susceptibility, it's sort of the inverse of that, where you're injecting noise to see how a system responds. And then when you have radiated, you have two types of radiated uh, phenomena, the emissions, again, something coming out, and radiated susceptibility where you're bombarding it with a certain level and frequency of energy to uh, simulate the environment. So why these tests? Well, you know, as soon as radio was born, uh, interference uh, appeared. And uh, so going back to, the, to World War II and even before, you know, they had uh, tube radios, and a lot of the tests had started with interference to audio systems. And I kind of break out the uh, different phenomena here. So the first line here, CE 101, CS 101, RE 101, RS 101, are kind of low frequency generally uh, and audio noise phenomena. 
uh, that um, are, are, are studied here and tested. Uh, the second line is the higher frequency conducted coupled phenomena. Uh, CE 106, 104, 105, RE 103 are all antenna or transceiver related phenomena. Uh, CS 118, which was initially adopted in 461G is a electrostatic discharge requirement. And then RE 102 and RS 103 are box and cable phenomena, both on the emissions and the uh, susceptibility side. And RS-105 is a simulation of radiated electromagnetic pulse, such as would happen during a high altitude burst of a nuclear weapon. So I started my uh, career when 461C was the most um, up-to-date standard, and it was issued in 1986. We still see some 461C uh, requests. They're rapidly disappearing, but every once in a while, there's a legacy where we have to do something according to 461C. Now, the tests aren't that different, but some of the setups and some of the uh, other phenomena have been more uh, closely defined and in, in, in recurring in um, uh, versions of 461. And it also serves as a basis for other types of uh, aerospace specs, notably the General Environmental Vehicular Standard, GEVs, that was uh, written when the space shuttle was flying or was being designed. So we see, still see it sometime. And 461 uh, had its couple, its, uh, its sorry, companion standard 462, which was uh, discussed uh, layouts and techniques for the measurement. So the earlier versions of 461 had limits and levels, but not so much in terms of uh, test setup. So uh, 462 was used as a guide to uh, set up um, uh, the equipment and do the tests. So 461D was quite a departure. They integrated 462 or elements of it into the, the whole document. So that had more defined setups and determined uh, things like cable setup. So repeatability could be uh, improved. So I talked about that. So E is a continued version, uh, revved in 1999, and we're up to 17 requirements at this point for conducted emissions, susceptibility, radiated emissions, and susceptibility. And in this case, uh, this is kind of the beginning of when tailoring was uh, specifically prescribed. You can tailor the environment or the levels depending on where the, um, where the procuring agency may accept. So we get into that uh, quite often where, um, you know, you may look at uh, the installation of a piece of equipment and in, in concert with the procuring agency or the, or the contractor, whoever, uh, you can sort of horse trade and perhaps more tightly define the specs. And you might, you might increase the level, the requirements, again, depending on where the thing might be in, installed or what it's, it's, in, it's, uh, um, criticality is in the whole system. F is a continuing version. Again, more uh, experience in the years of experience in the laboratories, the committees that put this together. Now we've, they've got 30 years or more of doing this kind of work. And so it uh, was adopted in 2007 and we're up to 18 requirements. And again, may be tailored. So the scope of 461 uh, kind of applies across the whole uh, DOD agencies. It's not intended for modules inside enclosures or entire platforms. There's a 464, which is the system level EMC test that uh, maybe some of you are familiar with. So typically uh, things that fit in racks um, has discrete interconnect wiring and powered from prime power sources. Now they may be uh, applicable for other applications, and there's been a few times where we've adapted uh, military results into uh, our notified body scheme for Europe, which allows um, some discretion for notified bodies to apply existing uh, test uh, results in order to comply with the EMC or radio equipment directive. So it's um, maybe um, non-contractual, it can provide guidance and uh, rationale, and um, then we're on to 461G, which is a continued refinement of the 461 series. Again, applicable for DOD, builds on 461F. Uh, it adds an ESD, electrostatic discharge. And as I mentioned before, 
the current version of Appendix A is, is a good read if you want to have a foundation for the rationale for performing this kind of work. So I mentioned this, Appendix A, it's got, uh, this is also in uh, F as well. So it really looked at a uh, major effort removing, reducing the errors uh, across various uh, interpretations. Because you, you know, you get uh, two engineers in a room, you'll get three opinions out of that. So um, inconsistencies are trying to narrow those things down and confusion from earlier versions. So one of the items there, be aware of these uh, so-called documentations or data, data item descriptors. Um, there may be a procedure. Uh, often a uh, procedure is, is advised, particularly for complex systems, which can define the setup and um, <clears throat> or the design of the device and uh, going through a control activity. And then the test procedure under that data item would be the exact uh, requirements for test levels, if you're tailoring it all, uh, you know, test distances, if you have something different from what the standard calls out, and also uh, how are you going to monitor and control the device or system while you're doing the test. So as much of that stuff is defined as possible is very helpful, uh, particularly for the, for the test lab personnel. personnel. Now, saying that, there also should be some flexibility in the procedure because once you get in the lab, things happen and uh, every day. And so, you know, it's, it's great to have a little flexibility while you're doing the test. Of course, the, the communication route has to go back to the ultimate procuring agency if, if some kind of change or variance in the test procedure is warranted. And then when all the dust settles, uh, obviously there's typically a test report, which will have, uh, you know, various elements of the uh, results, obviously, the test data, test equipment, calibration information, location, environmental conditions, if that's important. Um, and all that will be documented in the test report with pictures and photos and setups and so forth. So this is the uh, requirements. Um, there are 19 here in G, uh, that CS118 is only in G, it's not in F. Um, uh, this was added. So this is personnel borne electrostatic discharge. And it's uh, very similar to uh, uh, commercial or consumer ESD uh, um, test procedure and levels and so forth are specified. And, uh, but it's very similar to if you've been doing CE marking, uh, very similar type of testing. Uh, is required. One thing that is necessary for this is to uh, characterize the pulse um, uh, uh, behavior uh, every time you do this test. So there's a target and you zap the target and you verify that the waveform looks right, the rise times are good, and you're getting the expected uh, discharge voltages. So here's a 461F applicability. There's 18 tests. And you can see, depending on the installation, whether you're on a surface ship or a submarine, that the different levels are called out, or the different tests are called out, sorry. And underneath each of these tests, there may be different levels. For example, for conducted emissions, there's different levels for Navy and Army and Army ground and so forth. Um, so you got to dig into the standard in order to define the test level that you plan to do. Uh, same as G, pretty much identical, again, adding uh, ESD under the CS118. And you can notice that these uh, definitions, uh, you know, if there's an A, it's applicable without uh, further comment, uh, limited, it depend on the uh, specifications in the standard. And then uh, S is a procuring activity must specify in the procurement documentation. So one of the first things we asked for is uh, is that procurement documentation to make sure that we're, number one we're we're getting the right version of the standard because a few of them are floating around as I mentioned. Um, number two, what's the applicability? Where do the tests are, have to be carried out? Because this is going to depend on which procuring agency and where that box or system is going to be uh, is going to be installed. Sometimes, uh, surprisingly, it's not always easy to get that information for, for us um, for, for various reasons, either bureaucratic or, uh, or other, I don't know. Um, but we really try to get that information up front as much as possible because it can really affect the scope of the test, the time, and of course, the cost. <clears throat> 
So generally, you know, you have to have uh, general interface requirements. You got to make sure that the thing is going to interact correctly with the rest of the system or platform. Uh, general verification requirements. How do you know it's going to be working? What are how do you verify that the uh, device is communicating or interacting correctly with the platform or system? And so these might be in addition to detailed emission and susceptibility requirements. So this again is sort of the chain of communication from the procurement agency through the vendor to the test lab. Um, make sure that things move as smoothly as they possibly can. Uh, there's also some limits on accuracy in terms of uh, you know measurement distances, which are specified in the standards, uh, frequency behavior, amplitude, accuracy, um, time, you know, and various other um, uh, parameters that must be carefully observed. This testing is typically performed in a uh, shielded enclosure to prevent interaction with the external environment, either interfering with something while you're doing a susceptibility test or trying to get a good measurement of the emissions profile. Uh, the size is important. You know, you have to have the right size, correct keep off distances away from the anechoics. And uh, right behind me is a, is a typical panel of an anechoic absorber. And this is a, is a wide band absorber. It's a closed form foam cell. Uh, we just commissioned a new chamber in February this year, and this is a piece off of the chamber. I hope they don't miss it. Um, other test sites, you may choose uh, the, the system may be too big, or it may be an in-situ test. And so that's another kind of challenge and a skill to be able to do uh, susceptibility testing particularly, and uh, emissions testing notably in an ambient environment. How do you deal with these ambients? So this is an overview of the uh, general test, uh, anechoic test setup. Um, you have the boundary there, which is defined by the distance, the keep off distance from the absorbers, and also the test antenna location. So typically the antennas are located a meter away, depending on uh, um, the size of the antenna and so forth, but from the tip of the antenna to the uh, test setup boundary or the, or the EUT location, it's typically a meter. <clears throat> this is, uh, came out of the, uh, my, my museum, and this is a rod antenna uh, of, of some, some vintage. And uh, the actual rod antennas that we use will have a ground plane that's associated with it, but uh, this is kind of one of my favorite things. And, uh, you know, the frequency is in terms of megacycles or megahertz for those of you that are over 30, under 30. So uh, your environment has to be carefully controlled. Uh, the ambient should be limited uh, as much as possible so you can get some headroom between what your emissions levels that you're expecting and the limit. So 6 dB is uh, usually prescribed. Um, so if you have, um, if you're looking at ambience and you have some issue, it's best to resolve it because it probably means you have a leak in the, in the shield somewhere or you're measuring something very, very, very uh, low. Uh, the ground plane, uh, metallic, uh, typically, and uh, there's a minimum size for that, and there's uh, they can be quite large, obviously, and uh, the resistivity is typically has to be very low. Um, most uh, chambers that I've been in uh, may use uh, may use copper for the ground plane of a minimum thickness, or often just use the uh, the actual shielded enclosure ground as the ground plane. It's typically a galvanized steel, which has uh, plenty of uh, conductivity. Now, so, sort of a specialty anechoic chamber, or sorry, or a shielded chamber, sorry, is a reverberation chamber. Um, and this is used to produce tremendously high levels of radiated fields. And what happens is there's a, a uh, field generation antenna which simulates or stimulates the environment. And in order to distribute the energy across the volume of the ear testing, there's various uh, stirs or mode, mode stirs that are uh, installed in various locations. And this spins the energy around and sort of uh, distributes the standing waves in the, within the chamber in order to get a, a higher field level because it, the chamber is, is not absorbed. There's no absorber on there. So you get, uh, you know, tremendous reflections and standing waves. And so the stirs sort of move these modes around 
and you're, you can get some pretty high level fields um, using this kind of uh, installation. Open area tests, we've done quite a few of these. You know, if you have a large vehicle, um, you have to take special care about ambience. Something like this might uh, take place in a large field or a parking lot, um, wherever might be convenient. Uh, again, per the test procedure, you have to have some flexibility because uh, nothing is uh, ever goes off the, the way. Um, there's always, there's always uh, you know, some issues. So practical considerations, you know, be away from ambient sources, clean AC power, this can be tricky. Um, especially if you're using some generator, you got to make sure that you have provisions for filtering that stuff. Um, would you, if your program is going long, you may put an all weather enclosure. They, we have uh, one for our FCC site and it's a completely uh, non-conductive enclosure, uh, fiberglass and vinyl covering. So you don't get any sort of reflections. Um, <clears throat> so are you going to interfere with your neighbors, you know, in the, the FCC requires if you're going to do some intentional radiating out, out of doors that you have to get a special temporary authority, which is a, a, a sort of a license that allows you to transmit to open air uh, for a limited period of time and limited frequencies and limited power. So that, all that stuff is specified. So one of the things we really try to emphasize when we're working with our clients, not just mill, but uh, commercial is that, you know, we need to get ready for the test. And um, uh, is, is your equipment ready to go? Because you, you really don't want to be configuring it in the lab as much as, as much as you can, you know, it's, it's hit schedules and other, other issues that may be functional in nature, not, uh, not a, due to the testing. So typical configuration, what are the software modes? What are the power requirements? Have you told the lab that you need special power, you know, a high level of 480 volts or something else or high level of DC? Uh, all the cables for not just the internal connections, but to support equipment. It's best to communicate with the lab to see what kind of setup they have for accommodating support equipment, um, because you have to often leave that support equipment outside of the chamber in order to exercise it or to monitor the, uh, the equipment operation. Uh, do you have spares? And most uh, last, but certainly not least, is the pass-fail criteria defined. You know, are you looking at bit error rates uh, as a as a as a metric, or is there some variation in you know either temperature or voltage variations that have to be tightly controlled? So that this really needs to have a discussion up front. So when the testing is started, we can clearly define what those uh, requirements are. So here's a general test setup um, table, tabletop equipment, uh, the equipment, the EUTs on the left, uh, the power comes through a line impedance stabilization network or LISN. Um, the cables are, are uh, 10 centim sorry, five centimeters off the ground plane if you're using a ground plane. And we use this very high tech uh, two inch um, absorber um, thermal uh, foam for our uh, standoffs. And it's pretty convenient way. It's, it's just right on the five centimeter um, or two inch uh, of thickness. Uh, bonding to the wall of the panel of the uh, enclosure is necessary. And this is indicated here with these bond straps. And then you have to have a, a certain amount of uh, uh, conductance to, between the table and the, and the wall. And you can see there's an access panel. This is always configurable, uh, whether you're using uh, coaxial type interconnects or ethernet or plain old wire. Um, your power would, could go through there or it could be through a filter. It, it, again, it just depends. So this is a floor standing uh, situation. Uh, again, the lizens, they're bonded to the ground plane. I'm sure a number of you have seen them. Here's, here's a lizen, you know, pretty sexy. Power in, power out, and then the voltage sense um, uh, BNC connector right here for, for uh, measuring the, the noise voltage, common mode noise voltage on the coming from the equipment. Uh, here's one with a truck. Similar, you got the lizens taking the power in, got the non conductive standoffs right here, which foam. You got a certain amount of uh, minimum distance um, around the device to uh, 
move antennas if you're doing multiple sides, which is typical, uh, or to access the equipment in general. So for emissions, uh, there's a minimum emissions testing time, and this is based on uh, the, the resolution bandwidth. Um, and there's a minimum time depending on how you're tuning the equip uh, the um, analyzer. And most modern analyzers um, use uh, bins where they collect the energy as the res bandwidth is swept across the frequency. And so you can't move too fast or you might skip some skip some of that uh, those signals. Uh, here's the bandwidth or measuring times. It depends on the uh, frequency where you're measuring. And the IF bandwidth is the resolution bandwidth, more typically uh, um, called out or the nomenclature. Uh, the dwell time is shown here. And you have to dwell for this much time at each frequency. And so the minimum measurement time is there. So you can see that the as the frequency increases, the res bandwidth goes up. This is very typical and, and reasonable. And the, the dwell times are, are set as shown. And this is the reason is sort of pictorial demonstrated here why the uh, sweep times are necessary and the incremental uh, frequency steps are, are necessary. So uh, here's this sort of displays a, a bin uh, situation where a spec an is discreetly tuned across the frequency band. And these dotted lines uh, represent where the, where the IF filter is sweeping. So in order to capture narrow peaks, like you maybe have on the very le um, left side, um, you have to make sure that you have a full amount of the res bandwidth in order to collect all the energy at that frequency. So if you skip too far, uh, too, a larger step, you may skip over one of those narrow peaks. Now, this is sort of a step spectrum analyzer type of operation. There's also a uh, been around for a little while, receivers that use fast Fourier transform techniques. And these things allow a really significant reduction of test time. Um, it's they're really quite remarkable, um, but you do have to uh, make sure that you have the same minimums uh, as the spec and requires in terms of res bandwidth and, and so forth. And typically you may need to clear this through the procuring agency. So again, the test prep or test procedure time, this might be an item if, you, if your uh, laboratory uses FFT techniques for emissions. Uh, data presentation, here's kind of a typical plot. Um, you can see that uh, the, there's a peak on the left that barely, barely makes a limit or is it on the limit? Uh, you know, you need to have a certain amount of resolution, uh, particularly if uh, something is very close to the limit. Um, so you might, uh, what I would do in that case would probably take the spec and or the receiver down to that frequency and make a more of a manual measurement instead of uh, relying on the potentially uh, potential failure there. Uh, obviously, uh, the peaks on the right fail this particular test. Looks like a conducted emissions test. Oh, no, it's irradiated vertical. So it's a RE test. On the susceptibility side, you have the same kind of uh, dwell times that are necessary. Again, you want to make sure that you uh, run the, the, the uh, stimulus uh, during the, uh, at least a complete operation of the device. And so in this, in this case, uh, we have a step size with a defined step size and a three second dwell typically. But again, your rate and your dwell may be adjusted for your EUT response. Maybe you need 10 seconds. Some, some medical devices, you need a much longer dwell time, a minute or so, in order to uh, properly uh, assess it. That would be on like the FDA side, uh, not on the mill side particularly. But you again, this would go into the test planning or test procedure in order to tightly define what that dwell time is. And you may need to adjust it. Maybe you can go less if it's a very fast acting device. I don't know. Again, it, it goes into the test plan. And so it's one of those details that need to be uh, hammered out. Uh, the typical modulation of the susceptibility test is a uh, classic 50% uh, duty cycle, one kilohertz square wave. And so this is impressed upon the carrier and uh, it uh, is used to simulate a pulse type of uh, interferer. But you may have different types of interferers as well. Um, perhaps your, your, your potential environment has a more exotic type of um, uh, modulation that may be on an interferer. Again, this uh, depends on your planning for the test procedure 
and where your uh, device is going to be located in its intended environment. Here's the susceptibility scan rate. Again, it's dependent on frequency. And I would argue that um, it's very, it's pretty harsh or maybe a little bit unrealistic. Some folks may disagree with me, but uh, at the lower frequencies, typically you don't have super sharp resonances. And so perhaps you don't need to uh, go at this kind of rate. You can maybe go at a faster rate. Um, because th those increments at the low frequencies in particular are pretty small. And so you can spend a lot of time, you know, looking at something that uh, may, may or may not uh, have those kinds of resonances. At the higher frequencies, I, I agree that uh, you can have sharp resonances uh, at over, over certain frequency bands. And we've seen this uh, quite often. And so the, the, the step rate at the higher frequencies I think is a little bit more reasonable, but uh, that's that's just one man's opinion. Uh, this is um, basically shows this, the actual dwell times. If you're doing some calculations on how long a test can take, you can see that uh, one to 18 gig span uh, is a fairly uh, long test. It's an hour and a half. And uh, if you have multiple sides or you, you're gonna do two antenna polarities, so you gotta, you know, multiply that by n times m, whatever those things are, the number of uh, um, polarities and the uh, and the uh, locations. Uh, factors. Uh, when we want to get to a final number, we have to figure out what the correction factors are, and this is uh, for typical system gains and losses. For example, uh, antenna factors, which is a, a conversion of the electric field that's incident on the antenna element to the conducted voltage that you would plug into your, your spectrum analyzer receiver. So it's a conversion factor and it's typically lossy, almost always is lossy. And you get a dB factor that converts the electric field to a conducted voltage. And you can back out the E field from that conducted voltage knowing the antenna factor. So this is very typical for uh, a variety of transducers. Uh, current probes have uh, in, impedance um, um, measurements that convert the voltage that's measured here. If this is a measurement um, clamp probe, which it is, they can convert the voltage that's measured here to what the current would be on the cable that's going through it. And this is for, for a conducted emissions test. Uh, the other factors include cable loss, uh, pre-amplifiers. Uh, if you have a bandwidth correction factor, that may apply, um, depends. Uh, one of the things that happened with the uh, older, ver older versions, the 461, is they had broadband and narrowband uh, types of measurements, and you may have had a, a conversion uh, factor that you'd had to apply uh, to come up with, uh, with the answer for the protect data. So CE 101, uh, there's four limits. Uh, as I mentioned before, the previous slide or one of the previous slides have the different applications. So there's submarine, surface, uh, Navy, Army, aircraft, and you have AC and DC power sources. You might be at 60 Hertz or for aircraft, uh, perhaps 400 Hertz, and you may have DC. Uh, typically 28 volts is a, is a common uh, bus voltage for a, a number of systems. And for the CE, you would use a measurement clamp like this, put it on the cable, and then measure the voltage here as a function of frequency, typically in dB microvolts, and convert that to the amperage that is flowing on the cable. Here's an example of the limit. It's high at the low frequency, typically. Um, and so this particular curve is for surface ships and for uh, devices that use less than one kilovolt amp or one kilowatt uh, draw. You're allowed to adjust that limit depending on the actual current draw. Uh, typical test equipment, a receiver, a spectrum analyzer, uh, mill specs are all in peak detection, uh, as opposed to uh, commercial specs, which may uh, include a quasi-peak or an average measurement, but all the mill measurements and for emissions are in terms of peak detection. Uh, you have to be careful of your bandwidth, what bandwidth you're using over the frequency range, because it changes as you go up in frequency. Uh, I mentioned the current probe, you have a conversion factor. Um, transfer impedance, to call it, and for LISNs, which we already showed you this, 
they're used for decoupling from the source. So there's a big coil in here and some capacitors and stuff to decouple any noise from here into the measurement port. And you may have a, a typically have some kind of conversion factor to that you would add to the result in order to get the, the proper voltage measurement. That was for CE 102. For CE 101, it's all current uh, measurements, such as shown here. So we have the current probe on the cable. We're, we're five centimeters off the ground plane with our foam. And then you terminate uh, both signal points. Everything's in 50 ohms in, in our world for the most part. So CE 101 EUT testing, here's kind of a detailed procedure. Uh, again, use the proper bandwidth, and then you would plot the amplitude of the noise voltage that you're measuring as a function of frequency. Uh, ambience, you may have to deal with ambience. This is not uncommon. And so uh, what we typically have, or most chambers do, are some pretty beefy filters that are normally good down to a few kilohertz or so. So they really clean things up nice. Um, or if we're doing something out uh, away from the chamber, we often uh, filter the input power with a, a you know, a, a commercially available filter until we can get the ambience where we want them. So here's a typical test configuration. We've got uh, the device on the table. Uh, it's separated by the five centimeters in this case because it's a, it's a rack equipment, so it's not going to be in intimate contact with any any facility or with any structure. Uh, the current probe is there off to the left, and it's clamped around one of the input power cables. So we'll do these things one at a time uh, for CE 101. CE 102, we're up in frequency. We go from 10K to 10 megahertz, uh, applicable to power leads. And we also do a phase and neutral, both the positive and negative, if it was a, a DC uh, system. And we measure that in terms of voltage. And here's the uh, basic curve for 461F. And it has different relaxations on the right, depending on the input power voltage. So you get a little bit... Um, uh, more headroom uh, as the voltage, the primary uh, voltage goes up. But again, it's in terms of voltage or dB microvolts and in terms of frequency here. So there's the limit. And so you plot the emissions against that limit and make sure that uh, it's below that line. Uh, same equipment for 102, pretty much for the receiver. Uh, again, watch the frequency range and bandwidths. Uh, in this case, we recommend a transient limiter or an attenuator on the output of the LISN in order to protect the test equipment. And these things are usually fast diodes with a with a with a attenuator in there that reduces any uh, transient peaks that might be happening uh, when you plug and unplug the power source. Okay, same as uh, CE 101. Uh, select the lead, connect to the LISN port, and measure it over the frequency range. So in this case, here's the uh, limiter that's plugged into the output of the LISN. Here's a LISN schematic. You can study this, and there's a slightly different LISNs for different applications, uh, depending on what spec you're trying to reach. But this is the this is the 50 ohm, 50 microhenry LISN, because everything's in 50 ohms, characteristic impedance. If you're doing something in situ, this is a, uh, a design for a voltage probe, if you're not using a LISN. And I'll move through these uh, rather rapidly uh, because we're coming up to three quarters of an hour. So CE 106, uh, this is for conducted emissions on antenna terminals, as I mentioned before. So it's over a wide frequency range. It's obviously not um, uh, applicable around the carrier frequency if you have a transmitter. So you may need to either um, suppress that transmitter um, with a filter or something or a tunable filter in order to uh, get the limit down. So here are the limits, and you're looking at not just, uh, uh, you're looking at receive and standby limit, and then you have uh, limits on the harmonics. Here's a configuration. Um, you might have the EUT with the RF port going through a attenuator or preamp, if it's very low, into the spec in. And you may use a SIGGEN in order to test, uh, check your path losses uh, in your measurement setup. 
Uh, there's a particular calibration requirement, and this is normally required for um, every type of method. There's a pre-cal, and so you have to show that you're measuring what you're supposed to be measuring and at what level you hope to achieve. And again, all the gains and losses of these things. So you can you can study these uh, on your own. Uh, again, I want to move through this so we can um, meet our hour here. Uh, EUT testing. Yeah. This is sort of the prescription for that. You connect and you establish operation, make sure it's working. Again, bandwidth measurement time, and then you'd plot the results uh, as a function of frequency with appro appropriate conversions and corrections include, included. Onto the susceptibility CS101. Um, this is a low frequency measurement where you inject a certain amount of energy into the power cable of the device under test. And here is a typical level, depending on uh, what input voltage you are have. So greater than 28 volts, uh, you'd use the red limit and less than 28 or 28 less, you'd use the blue limit there. Here's the uh, setup, the EUT is on the right. You have a coupling transformer, which is a used to inject the energy from a power amplifier in series with the power line. Uh, the listen is there to decouple it. And then you typically have a 10 microfarad capacitor, this ugly little brute right here. It's been around the block a little bit. So this is a feed through capacitor and you have a 10 microfarads between the hot lead and the case. And then this will be screwed down to the ground plane in order to provide some bypassing. Uh, here's the test prescription. You adjust the level um, to the calibrated forward power that you had in the calibration. And then you may have a graph or something or a table, depending on how you plan to take the data. It's a manual test. It's a little bit messy, uh, but you have a scope here to monitor the, uh, the injection transformers here and the, the uh, signal generator and a power amplifier injects the energy on one side of the transformer, which induces a current uh, that is in series with the uh, power supply. And then you look for uh, any abnormalities as you would with any of these susceptibility tests. Uh, Intermods, the CS103. So you want to make sure the in band signals um, from an intermod product uh, doesn't create a nonlinearity that may spit out uh, additional emissions. So it's an injection test uh, using two signal generators, sorry, three signal generators perhaps, and then the uh, measurement receiver where you're monitoring the input and any response from the EUT. The test method is here. Uh, again, combine two out-of-band signals and apply them to the antenna port and see if that intermodulation causes any problems. Um, the setup, the, the frequencies are selected below depending on the, uh, the, uh, the tune signal of the, your desired receiver tune signal and then where your source frequencies are set at F1 and F2. Um, so this creates the most um, uh, likely kind of uh, uh, signal that you may get in the field. And you're checking to make sure the receiver selectivity is good. CS104 is a conducted susceptibility and rejection over high frequency uh, range there to make sure that your out of band stuff is not causing problems at the in band to the in band frequency. Uh, you may have to do this as a radiated measurement if the um, if the receiver is used with front end mixing and an antenna module. So you might not always be able to do this as a conducted measurement. It's much more convenient, uh, but maybe not always uh, possible. And here's the setup, very similar to the other uh, CS103, but we're looking at different phenomena. And here's the uh, CS104 TEP method, the basic concept for signal signal method. So you're doing an injection with an out of band sing single signal, or you may have a dual signal method. It's again, this is going to be dependent upon your test procedure, your test plan, perhaps, and it's going to uh, map out from what your test environment or your actually your operational environment may be, may be looking like. Uh, so this requires a little bit of upfront prep and, and some prescription in order to achieve this test. Uh, CS-105 is a cross-modulation test um, where the uh, strong out-of-bound signals are near the operational frequency. 
again, it's a it's a rejection test or selectivity test. Make sure that your receiver front end is is blocking unwanted uh, unwanted signals. Here's the setup. This is all in the four, in 461, pretty much. Very similar. Again, a modulated out of band signal in band carrier, and see what happens to the uh, response. Okay, we're on to the power line or CS106. This is a power line transient measurement. It's a little bit modeled on 461C, CS06, uh, which is still floating out there, as I mentioned. So you basically are pulsing the uh, input with a uh, certain type of uh, wave shape and you check the positive and the negative transients. Here's the prescribed waveform, and there are specially generators that have been designed or available for that with a peak of 400 volts, and then the, uh, the time uh, uh, performance is mentioned here. Here's the uh, setup. Again, it's series injection, and the typical box uh, that you might use uh, for the spike generator has these connections. And so there's an internal coupling mechanism. You pass the power line through there through the spike generator, and then you monitor it with an O-scope to make sure you're getting the right levels and you're getting the right uh, time performance. Oops, wrong way. Uh, mention here that there's a potential shock hazard because you wanna float the scope in order to make that measurement of the time behavior. And so you'd bring it up at a, a predetermined pre level and as with any susceptibility test, particularly surge or spike testing, you start at a low level and you increase the amplitude and make sure that you don't hit it with the highest level uh, coming right out of the box because you may have a susceptibility at a lower level or you may unintentionally damage the thing. So we typically wind up the, the uh, amplitude until we get to the prescribed level. It's five minute test, depending on how many phases you have, you gotta do each phase. And here's the setup. This is for a three phase device, but it's similar uh, for a single phase where you have the spike generator in series with it and you're pulsing the uh, each phase in turn. This is for a Delta connected three phase network where you don't have a neutral. And you got these these decoupling caps, you can see they're applied uh, from line to line to line to line, again, to decouple some of the energy um, so you're not junking up the power line. CS109 is a, is a kind of interesting beast. It's called structure current, where you're going to test the uh, susceptibility of the device to currents flowing on the actual frame or equipment. So it's applicable to submarines. Handheld equipment is exempt. Here is the current test level, and this is what it looks like. So um, you have the EUT here, and you have a half an ohm uh, resistance in series with this coupling transformer, and you're applying a CW signal through the coupling transformer that's driving currents across the surface of the equipment, and then you're monitoring the current with, uh, with a measurement receiver and a current probe. So uh, general configuration, isolate the AC power, disconnect safety ground of the input power cable. So be careful there. Uh, so there could be a shock hazard, uh, depending on if there's any currents or voltages or unintended voltages on the ground. And then you isolate it. And so you have just a single point. And then you do the test points again to find in 461F, depending on how the thing is mounted. CS114 is high frequency injection, conducted susceptibility or bulk cable injection, or you might use one of these guys, which is bigger than its other, his brother. And so you're injecting a certain amount of energy in here and driving a current into the equipment under test. So this requires a pre-calibration using a certain jig in order to uh, uh, set the drive levels. And it's a, um, applicable for IO cables and bundles and power leads. And again, it would be defined in the test plan or test program. There are a number of different levels, um, depending on the, uh, uh, the which DOD department 
and which the installations are. And you can see there's, in this case, there's five curves shown for CS114. Again, this would be defined in the test program, depending on where the thing is going to be installed. Uh, this is basically the same thing, uh, but shown in a tabular form and shows the uh, procurement agency on the left side, as well as the, the levels that would be uh, applied. Here's a test configuration. You've got an injection probe and you're monitoring the input. Uh, you've got a power analyzer that's driven by a modulated signal generator. We're using that 50 kilohertz um, um, pulse uh, wave and um, 100 kilohertz pulse wave. And then we're doing some monitoring with a monitoring probe. So this depends on if you have a power input is shown in the upper left and then a signal input, it's the ex exact same setup. Whoop. So this is a curve uh, that was uh, generated by one of our tests here. Um, so a power cable. So you can see that depending on the impedance we set. So when you do the calibration, you set it to a certain level, not to exceed the, 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 the um, spec. And then you drive that power level back into the current probe while you're doing the tests. And you can see on the right, the monitoring probe shows that it went above the test level. And that's probably because the impedances of the cable are, are funny and they're not, they're not stable. So in this case, the device didn't fail even at that elevated level, but by we, we would be able to reduce that level to below the spec if we had to. Here's another, just another example. Here are the current probes uh, in two dimensions. Um, you can see that the jigs on the right-hand side are used to drive the levels through the test probe, and then you monitor the output. And you would set that, I'm sorry, you inject into the pr current probe, and then you monitor the output through the fixture, and that would set your drive levels. So here's a nominal setup. Injection probe is on the outside of uh, the monitoring probe. The monitoring probe is next to the EUT. And that's where we're looking at the drive current. CS-115 is a bulk cable injection from impulse excitation. And there's the next couple are kind of pulse waveform type of stimulus. Again, a specialized box to give you this time uh, behavior uh, and voltage behavior, rise times and so forth are specified there. Here's the uh, setup. You got the EUT and you have your pulse generated driving an injection probe. Oops. And you have a monitoring probe that you're looking at uh, the time domain as you're as you're injecting this pulse. Make sure that the the current is flowing in there, and you're getting the right uh, type of waveform. Now, what you're monitoring is not going to be what you got in calibration. That's because of the system impedances, the cable behaviors, and so forth um, are unknown. But that's why we we set the calibrations in a 50 ohm very stable environment then you get what you get once you start driving it often so there's the eu the testing this is kind of what i just said cs116 is damp sinusoidal transients uh, again depending on the uh, procurement you may go 10 kilohertz of ring wave to 100 megahertz and it's performed on io cables power leads and a 10 amp peak for all applications. So here's the waveform. That's what it looks like. And then we would adjust the frequency of that ring waveform uh, across that spectrum. Now our box has uh, fixed um, fixed uh, ring waves. So um, and that's a typical of the type of equipment. So again, there's a calibration using a cal jig, pretty much similar to how we uh, calibrate, pre-calibrate for CS114. And here's the test. Put the injection probe on there and hit the hit it with the uh, transient generator and monitor the the waveform through an oscope. So again, this is prescriptive. Uh, you know, applying the current and making sure that you're getting the right uh, uh, output from the test generator. Uh, and then you continue to test it. So here's kind of a setup of the CS116. The generator's in the middle. We're monitoring with O scope, and the EUT is off to the right. It's a little one. Radiate emissions RE101. This is um, 
a magnetic field measurement that we use a small copper shielded uh, loop antenna. And we have our calibrated foam here to keep the, certain, the right distance away. So we're measuring across the uh, EUT faces and cables and so forth. Again, it's going to be dependent on the test plan. Here's the limit for Army and Navy. So this is in terms of DB Pico Tesla. So you got to pre-calibrate or under, know what your calibration or antenna factors are for, for your loop. So you can convert the voltage, DB microvolts, to DB Pico Tesla. RE-102 is an electric field measurement. Um, back in the olden days, this guy would be used in the low frequencies up to 30 megahertz. I'm sorry, up to 30 megacycles. And there's different antennas depending on the type of uh, um, frequency range that you're interested in. Here's the limit. Uh, Army, Navy, mobile, this, they get the tightest limit. It uh, can be a challenge sometimes. So you use a combination of uh, preamp preamplifiers and very sensitive uh, uh, spectrum analyzers in order to get that sensitivity. But it's a limit that is a radiated electric field. And here's the test configuration. Here, a meter away from the EUT, uh, you have a certain amount of cable in front of the EUT is, is uh, required. And depending on the frequencies, you may have to do multiple uh, locations because of the beam width of the antenna. And this is notably more important as you get into the gigahertz territory. So here's the typical placement. We have a biconical for the low frequency and we have a double ridge horn from 200 megahertz to a gig. And so you have uh, the typical height here and then the one meter spacing to the front of the EUT or the test setup boundary rather. Here's pictures of uh, several antennas. The guy on the left is uh, you know, the grandson of this guy. He's got the ground plane. And then we have a log periodic, I mean, sorry, sorry, a double ridge guide on the right and a biconical on the bottom. So very typical. Here's a test setup, we're a meter away, we're using the big horn and we're making measurements uh, um, up to uh, a gigahertz with this particular antenna, 200 megahertz to a gig gigahertz. Uh, the lizens are in there. The lizens are always in there um, for pretty much every setup. RE-103 is for uh, antennas, and we're looking at uh, out-of-band measurements and a radiated case. Again, this would be set in the procurement specification. Here's a RE-103 test limit. Uh, this here, the transmitter is running at about two and a half gigahertz, and we're measuring from uh, in this in this profile two megs to 18 gigs. So our program, we had to uh, change antennas out at different frequencies, and so this is a compiled measurement uh, from a couple of different plots. But the antenna has changed from from a low frequency two meg, probably used a, a rod uh, rod antenna, and then at 30 megahertz, there's a slight dip here. This is a, indicates an antenna and a bandwidth change. Um, and then up to 200 megahertz, we have another segment here that ran to a gig. And obviously above a gig, we have a different antenna and different preamplifier um, and a little bit of better sensitivity, sort of. But we can see that everything is uh, several dB below the limit. So this looks like a good pass, obviously ignoring the transmit. Above 18 gigahertz. And here's a test uh, uh, configuration and we're looking up to 40 gigs, I think in this case, looking at the equipment. So we're, we've mounted our little horn on right directly to this preamplifier in order to minimize any cable losses and measuring uh, the output from uh, whatever that device is down there. Radiate susceptibility, RS-101, low frequency magnetic field measurement. So we use this guy right here. And there's a loop of copper um, uh, wire here. And then we have a monitoring probe, again, another loop that sits inside of this. And depending on the uh, levels, we would turn this, uh, light this thing up with the frequency, sweep the frequency, and then move this around or place it in particular uh, locations, depending on the test plan. So it's performed on all EUT faces and IO connectors five centimeters away from the um, uh, from the face of the EUT. Here's the RS-101 limit. We're looking at low frequency mag quantities again. So we're back in dB Pico Tesla. Test uh, configuration is shown here. We're uh, driving it with a signal source and we're monitoring at 
the current with a spectrum analyzer, and we're staying five centimeters away from the EUT. Again, the lizards are in there. The lizards are always in there. So here's a setup. Uh, not much to see here, um, but the lizards are there. We're on a copper ground plane. We have our isolator, uh, and uh, we're measuring. The, this is a manual measurement. So uh, the loop antenna is off to the right, but you would hit all the faces of the EUT and the connectors. RS-103, electric field susceptibility. This is a broadband test, two megahertz to 40 gigs. You may, may be less. Uh, again, it depends on the procurement spec. We often see things that go to 18 gigs. Uh, and it's mentioned here in this third bullet, typically 18, but may go to 40 gigs if specified. Horizontal and vertical antenna polarities above 30 megahertz. Uh, and the limit is selected by the application. And here are the various levels, uh, depending on the installation and the service. You can see that uh, the Navy um, submarine levels are quite low, five and 10 volts per meter, because as expected, you're in a big metal box and uh, you're not expecting to have a lot of uh, high uh, level RF fields. On the other side is the aircraft and uh, above decks Navy. So have up to 200 volts per meter in this, in the 461. So you may have tailored specs, and we've seen some specs which, uh, depending on the installation, may be thousands of volts per meter, and that has to be done typically in a stirred mode chamber uh, specialty equipment. Here's a test equipment uh, setup. We have a field sensor. We're driving an antenna, and it depends on the frequency range, which antenna. And we're driving with a SIG gen and a power amplifier, and the SIG gen has that modulated uh, uh, burst D1 kilohertz applied to it. Uh, we saw this already. This is the uh, reverb chamber method, again, for generating extremely high levels. RS-105 is an EMP pulse, basically. And you it's a five nanosecond rise time, 100 nanoseconds, uh, 50 kilovolts per meter. And so this is uh, specialty equipment, pretty much. You use a, uh, uh, let's see if I can, whoop use a, 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 a strip line type of arrangement, um, two parallel plate antennas, and you would um, mount the equipment within a certain zone where you know that you're getting the uh, type of uh, radiation that you expect and the pulse that you expect. So it's called the usable test volume. So there's a specially transient pulse generator again, and so we're monitoring it with the output with a scope, and then we are bursting this the EUT with a very high level electric field. Not a lot of energy in there, but it's a pretty high voltage. Again, simulates a EMP pulse. So that's my walk through these uh, tests uh, pretty quick. Uh, I apologize for that, but I wanted to kind of give you an overview, a feeling of what all is involved with this type of testing. Uh, I'd be happy to see if we got some questions in the chat. All right. Thank you, Mike, so much for that informative webinar just now, that presentation, so thank you. And we do have some questions. Good. Let's get right to it. Um, the first question was, will a set of this, oh, <laughs> that's for me, will a set of the slides be sent out? Yes, I'm gonna send um, the presentation to everyone who has actually registered, probably sometime in the middle of next week. Um, so please, if you haven't got it by Wednesday of next week, to be safe, go ahead and email academy at WLL.com and let me know you have not received it. But yes, that is my plan to get them out by Wednesday of next week, the latest. Okay, second question, um, CS102 setup. Can you reshow that one? CS102, CE102? I have CS102. We, uh, don't, there's, no, uh, there's no CS102 test. Okay, maybe they meant CE 102. Maybe they exit again when I get down to the bottom. Um, can you re explain what the CATS loads are for? Oh, are for on that test? Okay, so maybe. Can you repeat that, please? I'm sorry. Uh huh. Can you re explain what the CATS slash loads are for, for on that test? CATS slash loads. I'm going to go back to CE-102, assuming that's what it is. Yeah, I'm thinking so. 
get there eventually. Hang on. CE 106. CE 102. No, I'm not. I'm. I'm really not sure uh, what the reference is. I apologize. Okay. Explodes. Yeah, they might react when I get to the bottom. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, the attendee who sent that in, if you could maybe react it um, for me, if I can read it out correctly, I'd appreciate it. So we can get your uh, question answered. Okay. Next, um, for doing pre-compliance work. How can someone get more detailed education on the on these tests? Uh, well, I, I tell you, 461G has really good uh, narrative, excellent prose, and I suggest you study that. Um, we're we're happy to answer questions. You know, if you if you run into a particular setup that you'd like to have some guidance on. Uh, we often do that, and um, I, I'm happy to, uh, you know, communicate by email. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, what is your favorite and least favorite test to perform? <laughs> <laughs> I love them all. Oh, um, my least favorite one uh is um well they're all very interesting they all led some insight to into physics really because it's all just physics um but i suppose uh one of the most painful ones are probably the uh, radiated susceptibility tests because they can take a long time may have many um and i'm, I'm speaking as a as a lab operator here um who often quotes things for fixed price so often the scan times are long and uh, it's often a very boring test, hopefully where nothing happens. And then depending on the frequencies, you may have multiple antenna positions. So it can be quite laborious. And uh, again, going back to the test planning uh, procedure, you know, we pay careful attention to what's being specified and often advise uh, clients to, uh, you know, go back to the procuring agents to See to see what's reasonable, but and my very favorite test, um, oh, probably <laughs> um, uh, emissions test. Um, that's that's when you really get some insight into what what your device is doing often, and it's uh, you have to you have to pay attention to a lot of details in terms of your setup and your instrumentation control. Uh, it can be tricky. Um, so it's it's usually the first one we typically perform, uh, one of the emissions tests, either conducted and or radiated emissions, uh, because that's often, particularly for digital devices that um, may not have any special, you know, radio transmit circuits, it's usually the one that fails the most. And um, so we can't go on, you know, if, if we can't pass the first couple of tests. So that's that's indicative of how the rest of the program is going to go often. All right. Um, can you comment on any trend of allowing commercial standards to be sufficient for military application? Depends on the installation. Um, some of uh, the agencies may take commercial equipment to be installed in non-critical environments. Um, so this is this typical, you know, commercial off-the-shelf or COTS equipment. Uh, may be specified in a military application. Um, it's not unusual for some integrators to, you know, have a, a laptop or something that's off the shelf or nearly so as, as part of their operation, but it gets assessed. Um, we don't see too many times where the, um, one of the agencies would off, you know, just off the cuff accept a, a commercial test report uh, for military compliance because the setups are quite different. The limits are different. The phenomena are the same, but uh, the levels and, and the test setups are, are quite different. Okay. Um, next question. The lizards are basically working like CDNs in the immunity test. Would you say that's correct? 
No, the lizens are uh, used for emissions measurements. Uh, they're not typically used as an injection. I've done it. I've used, uh, you know, for certain high voltage uh, applications where you don't, we don't have a, you know, a 480 volt coupler. Um, with with permission of the uh, of the customer, yeah, I've used it as injection, but typically on only cons commercial products, not on military. But the lizens are there to stabilize the impedance, present 50 ohms uh, to the measurement uh, um, uh, cable. For example, for the CE-102, it provides a 50 ohm uh, standard impedance. And then there's a L's and C's in there. There's a big old choke in there and some capacitors that bypass the in incoming power. Okay. Um what are the more expensive tests for the lab and the customer? Well, you know, you got to start from somewhere. I guess incrementally, um, RS-103 at high field levels can be expensive. Um, that equipment, you know, you have hundreds of watts of power amplifiers that you need to have. Um, you always need a chamber, so there's no incremental cost there but that's a pretty expensive one. Um, again, if, if, you're, if, you're in the, if you're in the business, you know, you have to capitalize that, you know, very expensive capital equipment. So it's understandable, but you know, the RS-103 high field level stuff can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. All right, uh, next question. The truck, as, the truck as EUT over the ground plane, it had a straight line. Was that a mistake in the spec or did you draw it by? Let me see. Let's get out of this mode. Find the truck. Uh, this one, perhaps. Um, so the, the dash in this case is just a indicating a boundary. We don't and agree, Mike. Huh? We don't see this, but you're looking. Oh, 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 hold on. Where am I? I stopped sharing, I guess. Wait a minute. Yes. That's it? That's it. So if this is the truck, that dotted line indicates the, the zone or the barrier where there's nothing else, you know, that can affect the measurements, either a building or something like that. Um, if the other truck here... Um, what about this? Well, what about that? I guess um, someone else drew this and I borrowed the slide. I'm assuming that that is the IO cables or support equipment or something like that. So that has to be dealt with and you may end up locating support equipment pretty far away in order to not affect the results, especially, you know, if you're in an open area environment where um, you know, you can't control how you interface with the equipment like you would perhaps in a uh, anechoic chamber. So I hope that answers the question. All right. And last question, it kind of goes back to that first question where we had said CS102 um, regarding the setup and then the caps slash loads and the um, attendee did respond and said, let's see, where is it? You had shown some components for a particular test. Um, they think that it was CAP. Again, I did put your email down there in case they want to just maybe email you. Yeah, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that. I apologize. Okay. I'm, I'm not putting it together. Yeah, so I went ahead and put the email down there, everyone, um, to be able to email Mike, and you can ask uh, more particular questions with him, and he'll be able to address those. And I'll put that back up. Last question, what are the best practices at the PCB design level to pass these tests? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, fundamentally uh, for emissions, you know, you wanna choose a logic speed just fast enough to do the job. Uh, you want to group high-frequency circuits together, including clock oscillators should be right next to the input. 
of the uh, chip that you're gating. Uh, outputs, uh, you know, if you have a if you have a long longer clock or distributed clock, you got to pay very careful attention to um, the the matching of the transmission line or the clock line, uh, so it's well behaved and you don't have any reflections, overshoot, undershoot. Uh, you know, the layout concepts are, you know, there's books written about that. Um, you know, decoupling is important. Uh, layer stack up is important. Keeping high frequency circuits away from IO cables or IO connectors is important. Uh, you may end up terminating address buses depending on the speed and, and the type of uh, uh, communications you're doing. Um, uh, don't ever, ever split your ground plane into different segments. Never, ever. Um, that is a bad practice that uh, we've spent hours fixing on per people's products. Um, you know, the, the layer stack ups are important. Um, if you have a multi-layer board, you know, more than four layers, uh, then you can consider running your high-speed clocks and signals uh, on an inner layer. And that provides some quote-unquote shielding. And also, kind of, it uh, makes the depending on the dimensions of the trace and the thickness of the dielectric and the material uh, can provide good matching, you know, for a high speed, um, a high speed signal. Uh, so that's the emission side. And there's many other uh, tricks there. Um, uh, that's the emission side. The, across emissions and susceptibility. We found that uh, you know you, you should tie your zero volt digital ground to the biggest piece of chassis you got. Um, it's typically um, the best design practice. I uh, universally suggest it, uh, and in testing, it allows you a little flexibility because you know for some reason you want to float the the ground or the zero volt digital return uh, from chassis. You can do that with say a non-conductive standoffs or something like that. But it's very difficult in testing to mimic that, to add ground pads. And so what I recommend, you know, as often as you can, wherever your mounting holes are, is you plate through to the zero volts, and that gives you an opportunity to ground your zero volt uh, plane. And what that does is it takes advantage of that typically larger metallic chassis. If you've got a, obviously this only applies for metal chassis. Um, it thickens up the ground plane, it minimizes the return impedances for high frequency signals, if you're talking about emissions. And for immunity, it allows the, you know, say you have an ESD test or some other test and you have a, a interference source that uh, that chassis to zero volt digital connection uh, improves the, uh, the, the conduct, uh, the reduces the impedance. And so you don't have voltage built up between different parts of the of the ground plane. On the immunity side, it's pretty much very similar to the emissions measurements. You know, keep your uh, sensitive lines away from IO connectors. Uh, if you have outgoing IO connectors, um, putting in, uh, you know, uh, space placeholders for filtering is a good idea if you can afford it in terms of real estate, you know, capacitors to ground or series inductors. Again, this can be tried out once you get into testing, you can always, you know, take or depopulate those particular parts, but it's, it's tough to fit them in if you have a retrofit situation. So that's just a few board guides, guidelines. All right, well, thank you. Um, I don't see any additional questions. I do see a lot of, or a number of appreciative comments for you presenting on this topic. So we do thank you for that, Mike. Um, if we, if you have another question after this webinar, he's put up this information here where you can always send an email to be able to get that question answered. Or give me a call. Happy to talk. <laughs> or give him a call. And so um, we thank you again. And on behalf of the Washington Labs Academy, I would like to thank you all for attending. I'm going to go ahead now and end this the event so you can enjoy the rest of your day. And please be safe out there. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Awesome. Bye, everyone.